Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Why do we remember sorrow over joy? Why do we always take the negative over the positive? Have you ever wondered that? Imagine, just think about it for a moment, you're taking like an employee evaluation or a student evaluation, 98% of that can be all positive, and what are you going to remember? The 2% that wasn't, right? It sticks in our mind. We have this tendency to focus on our sorrows. And because of that, at times, it seems like sorrow is the dominating force in our world. There's so much evil, tragedy, and sadness around that it can lead us to thinking that all we have is to despair in our sorrow. It can lead us to lose hope. Political fighting, wars across the globe, broken families, abortion, poverty, corruption, the list goes on and on and on. And when you say it like that, the question naturally arises, well, what hope is there? In our gospel reading, Jesus addresses His disciples and answers this very question of what hope is there. Now, to set the context, Jesus and His disciples are at the edge of the major point of sorrow and tragedy of Jesus' mission from the Father. That is, he is about to be arrested, suffer at the hands of sinful human beings, and die on the cross. And he's trying to prepare his disciples, knowing that they're not really going to fully understand what he's about to tell them. And some things he even says at the very beginning that he's not going to tell them because right now they would be unable to bear it. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me, he says. And then the text tells us that this is a head-scratcher for the disciples. They don't really know what he means. And if we put ourselves in their shoes, we would probably be in the same boat. What does he mean? A little while, you won't see me, and then a little while, and you will. But Jesus, because He's Jesus, knows what's going on in their hearts and the questions they're asking themselves and one another, and He anticipates their question in verse 19, and He says, why are you saying among yourselves what I, mean by, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? And then His answer seems a bit bizarre. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. You'll have sorrow. It's kind of odd. What is he saying there? What does he mean? Well, you and I have the benefit of knowing what comes next, and we know that Jesus here is preparing his disciples for what is to come. And Jesus knew that they still didn't understand the purpose of his ministry. At this point, the disciples still think that the Messiah has come to establish an earthly kingdom to overthrow the Romans, to set up a powerful earthly king himself. So when Jesus departs in death, they don't know what to do. It's not part of their plan, and Jesus is trying to save them as much sorrow as he'll be able to do for his disciples who don't quite get it yet. See, when Jesus departs in death, his enemies, the world, rejoices. They think they've won, and guess who thinks the same thing? His disciples. They do. And here in our gospel text, we understand that the root of all of their sorrow, of their weeping and lamenting, is that Jesus is no longer present that he's gone. Imagine that for a moment, because the disciples, they've been following this guy around for three years, spending nearly every day with him, hanging on his every word, and you combine that with them thinking that what he came here to do was establish a powerful earthly kingdom, and then he goes and dies. What are you left with? 
Just look at what they do afterwards. Most of them, they go into hiding, they lock themselves inside, afraid that they're going to get caught up in the scandal that is Jesus. A few, they leave Jerusalem despondent, thinking everything is over, the disciples on the Emmaus Road. They think it's done. They think it's over. They think they picked the wrong guy. Or at least they didn't have any understanding about what the Messiah was supposed to do. Because Jesus is dead. He's not the Messiah. He's dead. That's what they're thinking. They're going to get us as well. What do we do now? All those thoughts must have been going through the disciples' heads. And maybe you can relate at a time in your life of extreme sorrow. A feeling of despondency and despair. Of wondering... Is God even really there? Maybe He wasn't who I thought He was. What do I do now? But the key is, the disciples had forgotten part of what Jesus said here in John chapter 16. He doesn't just talk about sorrow. Verse 20, You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And then he gives the metaphor of giving birth, which is an extremely harrowing and suffering experience. And he says, but when the baby comes into the world, the mother doesn't say, get that thing away from me. It caused me all these problems and pains. As soon as the baby is placed in her arms, all the suffering is forgotten. And then he says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. That's the part the disciples didn't get. They forgot that he said that. And they don't really know fully what he's talking about, of course, until the Holy Spirit descends upon them and reveals it to them. But amid the disciples' hopeless despair, Jesus reappears. That's been the focus of the last couple of readings after Easter, is Jesus, our resurrected Lord, victorious over all of the sorrows of this life, reappears to His despondent and despairing disciples, showing up in the locked room, revealing His hands and His side, even to His disciple who disbelieves, opening up the Scriptures in true understanding to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then revealing Himself in the breaking of the bread. Jesus reappears. Your sorrow will turn into joy. Can you imagine going from that low to that high? Just think about that for a moment. The person you placed all your hopes and dreams on, not just yours but the future of the world, dies... You think it's over, it's done, and not just in a small sense, but you don't know what to do with yourself. And then He shows up again, resurrected, victorious, and now He begins to explain to you what He's meant all along by all of the things that He's been telling you, and your sorrow turns into joy. So what does this exchange between Jesus and His disciples, mean for us? Well, Jesus is talking about two events here. He's not just talking about His death on the cross and His resurrection from the dead three days later, although that is what He means when He says a little while. But He's also preparing His disciples for His ascension into heaven because then He's not going to be walking with them in the same way anymore. They're not going to be able to see Him face to face, nor do we. So what Jesus is saying here certainly applies to us today. Jesus isn't present with us in the same way He was with His disciples for those three years, walking with them, leading them, guiding them, speaking to them face to face. He is present. He comes to us through His means of the Word, which we heard today, and the sacraments, which we're going to participate in. He is present. He comes to us in those ways. But it's not yet complete. 
His presence is not yet fully here. But it will be. Just like the disciples had Jesus reappear in their lives and turn all their sorrows into joy, we too, in the midst of our sorrows in this life, Christ is going to reappear just in that same way. We don't know when. He hasn't told us. But make no mistake, He has told us that when He does, your sorrows will turn into joy. What a wonderful and beautiful thing. This is one of my favorite things about Christianity, when you really understand it. If you've ever been to a good Christian funeral, it's a weird place. It's a strange place to be, where joy and sorrow commingle so strangely. Because there's sorrow for those who are left behind, yet joy for the one who is now with the one person in all of the universe that can love them perfectly their Lord Jesus. And so there's also joy. And not just joy about them, but joy in that we anticipate that reunion for ourselves as well. It's a strange place, and if you're not someone who believes in Jesus, it's hard to understand. Just like the disciples who, before they received the Holy Spirit, they're like, what is this guy talking about? But I think it's extremely important for us to understand that because we do have sorrow. There's no use pretending we don't or trying to minimize its effects. It hurts. It ravages us at times. And sometimes it almost brings us to the point where the disciples were thinking it's over, thinking God isn't real or present and wondering, what do I do now? Jesus doesn't say that that's not going to happen. He knows it will. But he's even more certain that your sorrow will turn into joy because of what he is here to do, what he has successfully done. It is finished, he said on the cross. It is accomplished. What was he talking about? He was talking about your restoration, redemption, and salvation. And when Jesus reappears, resurrected, all of that is true. It confirms everything he said. That's why when somebody sets out to disprove Christianity, they always focus on the resurrection. And Paul says that too. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, everything else is in vain. We are a people most to be pitied. But guess what? He did. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Now our sorrow turns into joy for everything He said. All the promises He made about you, your loved ones, the sorrows that you're suffering in this life come true in Him. They turn to joy. You will see them again. And that's an important distinction for us to make as we go through the sorrows of this life. There's two, there's two sorts of sorrows. One is what the disciples displayed after Jesus died, a hopeless sorrow that gives into despair, and that's a belief rooted in the fact that Jesus is no longer present. He's defeated, he's gone, he wasn't who he said he was. But there's a hopeful sorrow, another one of those weird Christian phrases. There's a hopeful sorrow that is rooted in faith that Jesus is present, that he is victorious. demonstrated by the Father in the resurrection of His Son. Your sorrows will turn to joy. So are you sorrowful today? Maybe your sorrow is minimal today. Maybe, it's, maybe there's a lot. There's been a lot of sorrow in the last couple of years for many people. Lost jobs, lost lives, estranged family, division and brokenness in all sorts of ways. But hear the words of Jesus. So also you have sorrow now. He knows. He took that sorrow on himself. He knows it intimately. He knows what you're going through. He's present with you in the midst of it. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. 
never understood why people think Jesus is some soft-spoken, timid guy. We heard last week him tell the wolves outside of the flock, you might as well give up. You're not getting any of my sheep. And here again, no one is going to take your joy from you. Jesus is safeguarding that joy because it rests in the reality of His resurrection. So you have sorrows. I have sorrows. We've all lost loved ones. We've endured the brokenness of sin and all of its manifestations in our lives. And we'll continue to do so. Yet we are not hopeless in our sorrow. Christ has risen from the dead. So our hope is alive. It's true. Jesus doesn't downplay our sorrow. He doesn't try and gloss it over, but He does defeat it forever. And He does say that all that has been given to me, I have given to you. Dear friends in Christ, Christ has given to you life eternal. His perfect righteousness, the forgiveness of of your sins, so that your joy may be full, so that the sorrows of this life may turn into joy. This is what the resurrection means. This is why Easter is a joyous time, even when we are sorrowful, because the presence of a resurrected Jesus means that that is temporary and joy is eternal. Why did He leave? He left to prepare a place for you and me. And we heard in Revelation a little description of that place. Sounds better than any place I've ever been. That's a place where there's no more sorrow. A place where our loved ones who died in the faith live and will live forever. You will see them again. A place where our broken bodies are mended our broken hearts made whole. No more tears, no more sorrow. It's been turned into joy with the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, dear friends, don't give in to despair and hopeless sorrow, for yours is a sorrow that has joy within it. And for now, they seem like they're even at odds. But when He comes again, The joy will be so full, you'll not even remember the sorrows and sufferings of this life. And no one will take that joy from you. In the name of Jesus, our resurrected and victorious Lord, amen.